Welcome back to Gear and Beer. Today, our guest is Jack Roosh. Jack, grab something to clink into this beer with me, man. I got my uh, sparkling water here. Oh, sparkle it up against mine. Cheers, man. Thank Cheers. you for coming out. Thanks Absolutely. for coming to hang with us uh, here at the Gear and Beer podcast. Don't forget to follow and subscribe and all of that jazz if you guys are watching it. And uh, uh, immediately, Lyndon, I'm noticing that your battery is moved down from full to half full wonderful so we got that if it going. cuts it's the least important i will keep an eye on it um either way linda mccarty twisting and tweaking as always uh jack welcome man again thanks for coming you brought that beautiful guitar that i certainly would like to hear about um but uh we, we were talking downstairs uh, eating uh, wisconsin food mm-hmm uh and you said that you're from maryland is that correct? i am from maryland right on i don't think we've had anyone from maryland on this show i don't think so not that yeah. i can remember you I'm are the first you are the first man right. the first of your kind yeah first of your name um <laughs> another game of thrones re- references that you met do you guys watch game of thrones uh, i have watched game of thrones it's been you, a few years yeah. you remember how it was all you heard about until the last season pissed everybody off so bad that no one ever talked about it again. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that kind of weird? Yeah, it was like a team that just loses in the first round of the playoffs. It was like, like the like most the talked team. about show for you couldn't get away from it. And like I even I liked the show. I watched it. It was almost like the Dallas Cowboys or something. No, it was way better than that. Way better than that. Yeah. Trust me. Trust. Trust, bro. Trust um so maryland that's cool uh are you from like a musical family or anything uh my parents are big music fans you know big record collection my oh, mom cool. plays a little bit we had guitars around the house awesome. but you know not professional musicians but uh definitely a lot of music in the house did a lot, you a lot of different stuff did you find yourself picking a guitar up at a as a young person or is it something i started later? playing guitar when i was 11 so kind of like getting into adolescence yeah to your formative yeah. years there trying to figure out said. what i was gonna do you know getting out of comic books and you know wasn't really an athlete wasn't particularly good in school so had to figure out my my thing that i was gonna do you know sure sure and uh you know it was the mid 90s so music was huge it sure was guitar music for sure the golden years as i like to call it yeah it was a good time it was a great time all across all the different genres everything was ex- extremely well represented like from songwriting to arrangement to performance to uh just general uh progressive like theory concepts and mainstream songwriting i loved it the david david foster kind of kind of thing there was all it, kinds of stuff yeah and you could just sure. turn on the radio and hear a lot of good music which isn't necessarily the case now i mean you could literally just you know dial into a station and hear all kinds of stuff you know so that was you know it was great to have access to that because i'm you know i'm from a rural area it wasn't okay there wasn't much culture going on you know was the was it like country music was that the popular kind of thing around there or was it how's that part of the country i'm not really familiar I would say it's a little bit, it was probably more of a, I don't know. I mean, country music definitely had a place, but rock music was probably the most popular music. Sure. Okay. Um, I don't know. My parents weren't really big country fans at all. I mean, older so, country, but not like in the nineties, you know, there was a lot of the kind of, I don't know. It just wasn't in fashion. It wasn't sure. cool. So they definitely weren't into that. Um, a lot of like blues influenced music, you know. They grew up in the '60s, so a lot sure. of a lot of you know Bonnie Raitt, Little Feet, Hell yes. Stones, Almond Brothers, uh, which kind of led me. I wore once a Lowell George shirt on the podcast last night. Once I got, once I discovered like true blues artists, it, it was like a natural fit for me. It was kind of like when you say true blues, what do you mean? Um, well, What's the, the true. Well, I mean, there's a lot of blues, but the first sure. stuff that I heard that I would really consider not like Rocky, white not boy blues. not like rock. Yeah, for me it was Fre- Freddie King and 
and yeah. and Albert Collins were the two guys. Oh. I heard them on the same day. I was like twelve. The Iceman. Yeah. So, but and it was like a natural fit. It was like, oh, that's what I, that's what I want to do. I don't care what the people are thinking. I ain't drunk. I'm just drinking. I get so high. <laughs> Oh, I just take a little bit every now and again. Yep. And sorry. That's it. I'll put a link to that song so nobody thinks I'm crazy or whatever. Either way. You just have context now. It's an, it's an Albert Collins song. Yeah. Yeah. Called Classic. I Ain't Drunk. Which I think is just a hilarious song. Title. <laughs> uh I apologize. I interrupted you as I'm uh no, no- that's notable great. for doing. That's great. Uh at least to our listeners. But <laughs> so but so um but so great putting putting sentences together i'm doing all kinds of stuff uh we're so we're kind of talking about your formative years here like when you were in your picking up the guitar was it the blues right away that made you want to start playing guitar did you fall into the pearl jam nirvana kind of thing like yeah i I like that stuff i listened to that um it was um you know, from that kind of Hendrix was kind of the first true like guitar, uh, you know, idol that I had. Um, I liked. I mean, the guitar was just an instrument that was at my house because my mom had one, so it was like it's just an acoustic. If there was a dr- yeah, an acoustic. acoustic. If there was a drum set there, I might have sat and played the drums, but nobody had a drum set, you know. Sure. Um, so yeah. I, I liked all those bands. I just liked the idea of like a band, you know, and and uh, and I always liked music. But when I started listening to Hendrix, and that was from my dad, you know, he listened to that stuff. Um, that was when it was like, okay, guitar, that's the thing that yeah. I'm going to do. That's cool. And then, you know, you hear you hear Hendrix. There's tons of blues in there, and it was in all the other music that I was hearing. And then I heard. Probably like Stevie Ray Vaughan or somebody more mainstream kind of current like that. And that was a little bit closer. And then I got a VHS tape uh, on my 12th birthday or something that was called Texas Blues Guitar. And it had Freddie King, Albert Collins, Lightning Hopkins on it. Yeah. And that was, especially the Freddie King, it was like prime 70s, you know, big. Freddie King rules. Big collared suit playing big legged woman and going down and all that stuff that was it it like all clicked into focus it was like that's what i'm gonna do i have a specific big legged woman question so are you live version or are you studio version if you were to play that in your set which one would you pick because they're two extremely different interpretations uh i mean one is fueled by pure cocaine I like the live version, particularly from that video. It was like from a Swedish the one that's like, TV mm, show. Mm, do, do, it wasn't the mm, do, do. really famous uh, live concert that he did. I forget what it's called. I also, I don't even know. Um, this was like from a weird European TV broadcast. There was like oh. a bunch of, you know, hippie kids sitting around, but... For whatever I'm, I'm reason, man, that, to make that performance uh, was yeah, that's the one for me. Is it, the, is it a, was it the up tempo one? It's not super up tempo. Okay. It's not screaming somewhere up-tempo. between S- somewhere in between. Yeah, it's not as I definitely want to hear that. Yeah, I, it's just it's always been crazy to me because there's a bunch of different live versions of that that he like released on albums or whatever. Yeah, and they're all super fast, and the one on the like the album version of that song is so nasty and greasy and i just love it i would prefer i i would probably go slow i love the that a little bit more doom, funky boom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, doom. yeah uh, yeah that's i love that tempo i mean the up one's cool there's there's a bit like an old blues band from dallas the strata blasters uh they've been playing around there forever it's awesome the guy the runs the strata blasters also runs the dallas international guitar festival jimmy oh, wallace nice. um shout out to, to jimmy but they play that up version and it rules and they play in three-part guitar mini and like putting on a whole show along with it texas as is texas tradition but yeah it's awesome man it's cool man i mean freddie in that era had such a cool vibe man it's such a cool band the and like, tunes are all killer i think as a kid you know when you're like coming at it from hendrix and stuff 
I remember I like I remember hearing like Muddy Waters I think when I was 12 or something and it didn't click it was like it sure. seemed it, it seemed like old man music like yeah. guys in suits sitting in chairs which it was now of course I love that as much as anything it's totally. amazing but it it didn't have that excitement that kind of hit me when I saw Freddie it was like it had all that cool factor you know the clothes, the the whole vibe of it, and then great songs, and he played his ass off. Plays so. his ass off, and I, sings. He's like one of the best singers. He of totally all time. is, man. He totally is. And I, you know, uh, well, you know what? We'll come back to the Kings later. I, I yeah. have I have some questions about the Kings. So, like, <laughs> when when you uh, when rather when did you like first? get into a band scenario well so i grew up in maryland um my mom worked in dc and when i was 13 she got a job opportunity to work overseas in japan oh crazy! so we moved from like very rural maryland to tokyo japan which was a crazy culture shock it was nuts Uh, that is at what age i was 13 so it was like 97 so it was kind of like I mean there wasn't wasn't like nowadays where the internet and social media you can just like do all this research. It was really a mystery. We that's didn't know what we were going to get into. That's crazy. Dude. But it was great for me cuz I already I already was like done with my town. I was like I've done everything there is to do here. I knew I wanted to play music, you know, for my life and uh it couldn't have come at a better time. You know, to that's be awesome. to be in a big city. What I, I mean, yeah, what a just a a crazy thing to do to your brain at that age. It was too. pretty crazy. Yeah, I think I'm still recovering from it. Um, but yeah, so once I got over there, I met other musicians and the opportunity to kind of play in bands and play live. But I, you know, I liked Freddie King. I liked Albert Collins. So it wasn't like I was playing with kids my age. Sure. You know, it was older guys that kind of fell into a group of blues fans i mean over there they take american music very seriously like yeah. blues and jazz and rock um, it's, I'm not it's, them, it's it a seems huge i mean it's huge yeah um there's you can walk around and there's like entire record stores dedicated to like bebop that's it you know, That's it's cool. like a whole store and they just like the people are die hard into that or they're die hard into, um, you know, 70s funk and R&B or whatever it is, you know. So That's cool. It was cool. Yeah. And great guitar shops. And so that's kind of where I started um, actually, you know, kind of getting into what it would be like to play music at a professional capacity. That's cool. Um, so were you like, how long after you moved there, did you like, uh, you know, figure out how to like find the music? And well, so when we first moved there, we lived, um, near, sorry, I have so many questions. That's yeah. Yeah. I I kind of dropped a bomb on you. Uh, (laughs) so in Tokyo, there's a big park called Yoyogi park. It's sort of comparable to like central park in New York. Okay. Right. A big uh, they had the Olympics there one year, okay, in the eighties or something. Um, but it, on everybody in Japan lives in tiny apartments, kind of like Manhattan. You know, sure. it's like people don't have like a house like this with a jam room and a drum set and stuff right, or a right. garage. So on Sundays, um, bands would go out to the park and set up like at the perimeter of the park and just like play. You know, just have like jam sessions or rehearsals or whatever you know they would just it was a a, a place that was kind of it was socially accepted to just kind of go out there and set up and play and you could walk down the street and see like 10 different bands like a punk band or like a weird reggae band or that's fucking awesome yeah it was pretty cool (laughs) i don't know if it's i don't know if it's still like that but it was really cool and it was right by where we lived so like you could i would literally get up sunday morning just walk from my our apartment up to the park and there were some guys there that were like playing blues they were playing like uh hideaway and yeah. you know freddie king yeah. tunes and johnny winter and uh 
Almond Brothers and Cream and all that kind of stuff. Right. And that's um, cool, man. The guy that played guitar, who I'm still good friends with, um, he spoke a little bit of English, and so that was it. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. Were were uh, were you ever able to? And can you currently speak Japanese? I no okay. no not that's really. That's a that's a insane language. I can't even begin to. There was wrap my head around. There was a period there where I could kind of, I could kind of, you know, hold a conversation, you know, not not like a formal conversation, but with a friend, you know. Yeah, yeah. But man, if you don't apply that stuff every day, it just goes. How long right were you there? So I lived there uh, for four years. Four years. Yeah, but my my mom ended up working there for like twelve years, so I would go back sometime. That's crazy, know. man. Yeah, it was a wild thing, man. Um. When you came back, where'd you go? Back to Maryland? No, so um, I went to the West Coast. Oh, okay. I li- my sister went to college in, in the Bay Area, so I went to San Francisco for a few months, and then I uh, moved down to Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, I went to Musicians Institute down there. Yeah. And then just kind of hung around L.A. for like 10 years. That's Probably cool, way too long, <laughs> but well, it's kind of its own... It's a it's a cool place. It's own dimension, man. You get sucked in down there. I we we know a couple of dudes that live there that we know from Dal or that I know from Dallas, and they both. Yeah, are I've the, got some Chicago homies that that live there and and do very well. Love it. Yeah, the two the two dudes that come to mind seem to be just killing it out there. So yeah, it's a fun it's a fun place. I haven't uh-huh. spent much time there myself, but nobody cares about that yeah um that's cool so like what what acts were you playing at that age my first guitar was a squire uh fender squire 2 made in indonesia it was Uh, a strat yeah um that was not a bad guitar and then i what color was it it was black maple neck you know gilmore specs yeah Yeah. okay uh and then i cooler than my first guitar (laughs) yeah it was all right um, and then I, my first like really good guitar, I was a huge Johnny Winter fan. I still am to this day, a massive Johnny Winter fan, uh, especially in high school. Like that was my guy. And so the first really good guitar I got, I think I was 15. I got a, uh, like a Cardinal red firebird, like an early nineties. And unfortunately that guitar, um, fell and the headstock broke and I tried to repair it myself. It didn't really turn out that great. So I don't have that guitar anymore, but it sounded great. It's a great guitar. The freaking Gibson and the breaking headstocks thing, man. Rob Music's just recently b- broke off. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. The Firebird's particularly bad. I mean, really? it's, I mean, yeah, it's a giant, you know. He was worried about his for a year, and then it finally got knocked over, and it broke immediately. Just broke right off never seen anything like that in my life i've seen people try to break guitars and not be able to like trying to smash a 2004 squire like good luck oh yeah no those things are indestructible (laughs) like tanks man they're they're probably covered with that much paint you know they're not gonna they're not gonna budge Lyndon used to have a prs that was covered in bed liner (laughs) oh wow no i had it, it was uh it had a second coat of paint that was done at an auto body shop and it was like um it was like batman mobile matte black nice. um with all gold hardware uh because the previous owner was actually a huge batman fan um oh yeah and yeah uh, i sold that guitar Oh, I know. yeah. You, I, I have nothing else to say about it, actually. Yeah, I just thought it was funny because I always said that it was bedlam. I just don't. Yeah, I don't want to be like, like. I didn't hate that guitar, but it it wasn't something. After a while, I realized I just didn't. Want it, well, it's so you didn't hate it because it is a PRS, and almost everyone I've ever touched plays great. Oh, it played like a freaking Corvette. Yeah, sounding different story. Different story. <coughs> I've never had one. They're really cool, man. They're a very specific thing at this point in the guitar lexicon if you will it's the wrong word but that you know you got the pick up a fender a telly or or a strat and it feels a certain way you pick up a les paul or a sg it feels a certain way because of the scale length and then you got prs which is right in between the two and 
they feel a certain way Man, to me. The one I have now is amazing. You like it? I've I've been playing it every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that one was just like covered in in two, like you said, that super thick paint. I think it's like had that second coat of paint, and it's like auto body paint. Yeah. And it just it sounded about as choked off as you would imagine a guitar yeah, like great. that would sound. <laughs> <laughs> but the one I have now is actually is amazing. That's a, another matte PRS. That's kind of your thing. It is, yeah. But it's just one. Just one paint. One yeah, coat of I paint from a one, guitar shop and not yeah, right, right. Not from Mako. And it's one of their one of their better guitars. I like uh, or guitars. like I, higher end, I don't know, whatever. It is the opinion of this podcast that good guitars are cool. I I agree. Yeah. So they're hard they're hard to find too. Well, you know, there's just not any good guitars around. Not in here anyway. <laughs> but that's just the way it goes sometimes, man. You should play that 330, by the way, at some point before you leave. Oh, that yeah. Cherry yeah. Rit 330. Yeah, you really should. It's, sure. It is a fantastic instrument. It's one of my favorite sure. guitars ever. Sweet. Me too. And I was like, I was playing it on everything from it. I usually just play it on jazz gigs because it is hollow, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I've got a Heritage uh, one they gave me. It's their kind of version of a 330. I think they call it the H530. Okay. It's cool. It's hollow. I play it. It's like a Got great nineties in it. Yeah. It's a yeah. great, okay. like, I don't want to plug in an amp and I'm just going to practice, you know, cause you can hear it. It's real light. It's a good couch guitar. I did that with mine for a while. Just again, because especially like when I first moved to town, I was doing a lot of Broadway. It's like those, those gigs are too loud for the most part for that guitar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it starts to howl. But yeah, well, you know, but I started playing with bands that are not as loud when, and taking that guitar down there some and unless I turn all three of my overdrive pedals on, I'm typically okay. Yeah, yeah. And even sometimes with all of them on, I'm okay. Um so Yeah, I, sometimes an overdrive can cut some of that low end that's going to take off on you. Well, and on this Timmy, and especially, it's got that bass cut, and as you can see, all the way to the left is no cut, and I'm like 50%. Cut. I, yeah, I yeah. don't know if it's... I think it's like a sweepable uh, rain. It just keeps mm -hmm. going up or whatever. I don't actually know a lot about that pedal. I just got one because I saw one, and they're usually like 300 bucks. I think I paid like 150 bucks for it or something. Yeah, I tried one once. I. Uh... You know which one you tried? No, I don't. Uh, but I tried one once. I have a, a light speed like you've got down there. I love that pedal too. Yeah, that's cool. It's I, a very I, specific thing. I just, you know, a pe those pedals. It's like you got to plug it into your equation with what you've got going on with the amp and the guitar, and then every player's different. You know, everybody's totally. gonna. You know, people have like different, different hands. You know, the different sound that they get from just how they hit the strings. Well, and just from an electronic standpoint, like the way that light speed sounds plugged into a pro reverb versus how it sounds plugged into that match it's like those it's doing very different things to those yeah, 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 circuits sure. you know so you it's if i i would say that most of my pedals i can use on any of the one of the amps that i plug into that on this current board but i mean it's, it's i gotta like i gotta go through every pedal before and totally adjust the settings if I'm doing a gig. I mean, it's one thing in the studio. Yeah, yeah, just for dialing sure. whatever you need. But in a live scenario, you know, that's that's the way that goes. Yeah, I, I'm kind of... I don't have a big pedal board anymore. I, I put together one of those little nano boards, and yeah. then I just started using it for everything. I, I, I Originally, I put it together for flying, yeah. you know, and then I was like, well, I kind of just like using this all the time. Sure. You know? If you like it and it works for what you're doing yeah do it however you want that's what it, that is what this podcast says yeah yeah for sure that's, that's what i i have my hx stomp on a nano board and i was using it downtown at, at one point and then i just realized i like having a real amp better uh yeah. but i still use it as like a swiss army knife of effects and kept the the nano board and the nano board the rest of it is just it's like four you know drives like a booster and three drives i think actually yeah and it's yeah. great it's kind of like everything that i need um and i maybe if i was doing somebody's record or like whenever i feel like it, i'll bring out like a bigger board but i kind of feel you 
It's, it's yeah, really I have nice a, I have another. Would you board. call that a big board? Yeah, I think I have that same size board, or maybe slightly different dimensions. But I still have it. It's kind of like, you know, if the th- right thing came up where I needed very specific sounds, I would pull that board out and kind of slap all the stuff on there. Sometimes you need mm-hmm. a volume pedal. Sometimes you might need two delays, you yeah. know, or or you might. I need... always need two delays. Yeah, I don't, I don't like switching, and I like them both on at the same time. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, like if you need that kind of a sound, I just have one overdrive, one boost, and one delay in a tuner. What amp do you take out? Uh, I I've been playing uh, these Headstrong amps. I'm actually I just I'm just ordered a second one. Um. But the one that I use the most is sort of like a beefed up Princeton reverb. I I love Princeton reverbs. I used yeah. to have a, a vintage one. I feel like I rem- that's what I remember you playing. I I so like uh, I don't know maybe five years ago or something. I did some shows uh, opening f- for Marty Stewart with the was backing up a singer, and um, you know Marty Stewart and Kenny Vaughn and plays guitar with him you know that's like the best country band you Make can some see boys good yeah in, in my opinion and kenny you know plays a princeton reverb it doesn't matter where they're playing what the venue is it's a that's you know, silver face princeton reverb and a telly and very uh, little else you know and i always was under the assumption that well princeton reverb you got to have something bigger you need like at least a deluxe preferably like a pro or super you know you need something big yeah and i would sit every night that we did that tour up by the front of house and watch their set and i could not believe the sounds he was getting from that princeton and as soon as i got back to nashville i went and found one an old one and i just forced it into every situation i was in i was like no this is what i'm playing now yeah didn't matter if you're playing a big outdoor festival i'd put it up on an anvil case and crank it and you know and play it and it was great it was a great amp but eventually i was kind of like well there's a few things about this that i'm not losing at a certain point mostly like the the 10 inch speaker and the small cabinet it could get a little boxy yeah. when you're cranking an overdrive and and turning it up it, it it sounded like a small amp it sound you could hear that boxiness of it so i met this guy wayne who makes the headstrong amps and he knew about me. He'd heard me play through that Princeton and said, I've got an amp that you should check out. And it's basically a Princeton reverb, but with a 12-inch speaker. And with the power section, I, I think it's like the power section of a Vibrolux. That's so it's about kind of like what you just played through. It's about 25 watts, 30 watts maybe, Okay. with 6L6s. And it's great, man. Did you make a note of the Headstrong mm-hmm. amp? Right? Yep. Sweet. Yeah, that's my favorite amp. I love that thing. Dear and uh so linda was asking about your guitar uh why don't you uh, yeah uh what guitar is that so this is a guitar made by my good friend josh williams uh josh williams guitars he's based out of southern california that top is gorgeous he actually was just in nashville uh really a couple days ago yeah it's great i um what wood what wood is that it's maple is it I've never seen such a crazy looking grain before. Yeah, it's, it's cool. almost like a like a small cord corduroy. It is a little bit corduroyish. I never really thought of it that way. He makes his own plies. I mean, it, it's a really good guitar, man. It's Re- freaking gorgeous. You know, what color would you is that called? Well, um. I mean, it's a variation of a cherry red, but, you know, those old 60s Gibsons varied a lot. You know, some are real dark, yeah. almost like a wine color. And then you have, like, the kind of watermelony color. Um, I sent him a few pictures of, like, a 64, 335, you know, which I, I, I like that spec, you know, the small block inlays, the cherry red. And, um, yeah, he sent me this. It's cool. It's almost a little bit, like, purplish. Yeah, I was going to say, and so here's my personal issue for no one that cares. 
I have color deficiency, so like I can see colors. Yeah. But especially in situations with like glare and really bright or really dark lights, so like sometimes I can't figure out shades of stuff. Like, yeah. I knew I knew it was reddish, but it looked and still does look pretty purple to my eyes, especially the back. Yeah, it's a little purpley. But uh, I love it. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I like it. Definitely the finest iteration of that Gibson cherry red th- or wine red thing yeah, that yeah. I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, it's a really good... Does he have a website for these guitars? He builds and sells yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's called what? Josh Williams Guitars. Josh Williams Guitars. I'll do my best to include all these links. I know we often miss them. And by we, I do mean me. But. Yeah, he hand makes all these. Um, he's like a real luthier. He makes acoustic guitars too. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, I'm really. Uh, he's a great guy. What's the did, did he build the pickups? And the- these are tone specific pickups. These are actually for the Ford Thurston pickups oh, that he designed with yeah. them, which are really great. Um, I don't know anything about pickups. You know, I just I asked Josh. You know to recommend something i really did want to have uh like a push pull pot to do out of phase in the middle position because i love that sound albert yeah. king and all those guys you know but um he wasn't able to do that on this guitar but i think my next guitar will that'll definitely be, have that it'll make an appearance <laughs> yeah and possibly a veritone maybe you know get a little funky with it okay wait what's a very what do you what's a veritone like on a 345 you know that oh, little the dial or whatever yeah it's like a little switch of different it's it's basically like a filter oh okay. it just takes out more bottom end wow. gets real quacky and funky interesting i don't know i've never had one so i haven't I don't, either I'm, I'm not familiar with it i'll be looking that up later yeah, man. Uh, are, is the amp still on? Can you play it for a second? Let's yeah, amp's still on. Yeah, play that thing, man. Let these let these MFs hear it. Are those uh those pickups called burst buckers? Is that what he calls them? I think no, they're called burst, bloom buckers. Bloom, bloom buckers. buckers yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, burst yeah, buckers yeah. is a Gibson thing. Okay. Yeah, it's great. I, I, I most swanky like, as hell, my friend. Some nice ass lines. <laughs> I almost always play on the neck pickup, uh, but the bridge pickup sounds really great too. great man sounds awesome man it's really great really great sounding axe um oh, it's got the little bone saddles too yeah uh or yeah i nylon? think they're nylon oh, okay um oh cool yeah i don't know if that i mean so that's a 60s thing yeah it's a 60s thing. oh i didn't know that i don't know i, I couldn't tell you what kind of Gibson difference did it so makes. much crazy ass shit in the 60s with their acoustic and their electric guitars it's like it's like they're Put on, they were just like trying something new on every model of every guitar. I have just, the adjustable bridge J50. Oh, it's yeah. 1969, like the first square shouldered one. I like all that stuff. You know, it's a I, great guitar. I, when I was younger, had the opportunity to play a lot of vintage guitars. And, um, you know, the kind of the like all the sort of notions out there about vintage instruments. You know, there's a lot of strong opinions about it. Like, sure. you know, certain years, certain models, certain eras are the ones to get. But, you know, when you play like a broad range of instruments, a lot of the records that we liked were not made on like 59 Les Pauls or, sure. or you know, pre war D28s or whatever. Right. They were made on, you know, whatever guitars the guys had, which a lot of times, like with 60s and 70s music, they were buying new guitars. Sure. You know, a lot of 
great blues and R&B records were made on like late 60s, 335s and 355s and stuff. And there's something to those guitars. They're bright. Yeah. They're real airy on the neck pickup. They have a snap to them. Yeah, it's like a clarity, like a, w- yeah. a woodiness to the sound. Like you can guitar. play funk on a on a late. S- I mean, and and it's probably true in the same with with a lot of fifties guitars too. Sure. Um, but there is something to that, you know. And it's the same thing with country music with like later sixties or seventies tellies that are real bright. That are the black you know, uh, the white guards. Yeah. It, versus the black guards, kind of a thing. Yeah, it's just, you know, or you think, people think, oh, you have to have a pre-CBS Strat, but like Hendrix never played a pre-CBS Strat. You know, maybe in the very early no, you days. Did, you had a 63, but I mean, just like mine. all the ones that you think of, the iconic ones, you know, the Woodstock and everything, those are like late 60s guitars, you yeah. know, and it didn't, you know, so all that stuff, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, you know. What it really just comes down to does the guitar sound good? Yes, yeah, yeah. or no, move on from there. Yeah, and what are you really going for? Like, what do you really like? You know, the only thing that I would say, and it is a little more achievable with new guitars built to older specs these days, especially, but there is a certain quality to so two different aspects. What there's a certain quality sonic quality to in my opinion and this is just a this is my hypothesis i have no no research i something to the older pickups where the magnet with age has become weaker it picks up more of the sounds of the guitar both on the top and on the bottom and produces a clearer sound so i think there is something to older pickups and as far as the wood of a guitar, <laughs> bad wood is bad wood, but really old bad wood still really hard and ends up being, you know, quite tonal or can be. So I think, you know, the older a guitar, now an old guitar that's set in a closet and hasn't vib- been vibrated, like that's that's not going to sound. I always the same. wonder about those. I haven't I haven't played any of those, but I played a couple that Ford's had, but like not long enough to like be able to like draw any real inference yeah. about the you know overall tonal quality of the guitars. You know, the other thing is um, one of our mutual friends. Uh, his name's Noel Johnson. He's a great guitar player. Lives in Texas. He's um, a he is a guitar wizard. Is what he is. Yeah. Um, he he was <laughs> telling me one time about how. The, you know, Alnico, aluminum, nickel, cobalt pickups, uh, like pre a certain era are like have fewer impurities. And there's that whole thing. I don't know anything about it, but there's absolutely, I think, I think it's pretty interesting. I would love to know the truth. There's absolutely something to that. Just, uh, as throughout the course of modern industry, uh, as they continue to this day, like uh, eventually resources, they come at a premium so you have to start looking to cut corners if your company is going to continue to make profit and you have to buy uh, there's fewer and fewer pure things available and when you can find them they're more expensive etc blah 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 like uh boo and i were talking about this recently i, I went over to his house and he had this cast iron pan that's like 130 years old really and he had a brand new one and the way that the old one feels how smooth it is and just the is insanely different you the way it looks the just how the the composition of the have iron anything to do with like how often it's been cooked on or whatever or no it's the it's like the density of the and the quality of the iron that it was m- yeah. m- forged from yeah like old lodge isn't the same as new lodge just because of the kinds of steel that people are using these days huh. or iron excuse me not steel I- anyway that that's my two cents that yeah yeah i, I mean there was definitely mojo. a golden era of like a man uh, american manufacturing you know in the 50s uh with with guitar i mean with everything with cars yeah. you know 50s which, and 60s man yeah with the exception of some gibson acoustics and some other yeah i mean st- things in the 60s yeah well acoustics definitely are uh, but you know you know as well as i do if you want to sound better on the guitar 
practice. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> like you can, you know, uh, Jack Pearson's perfect example. He'll sound better than anybody on a squire, and nobody gives a shit about the metal in the pickups, you know. That's true. That's true. Uh, he sat in with my band one time on Broadway, and he took C.J. Wilder's rig, and he just turned every pedal on and played that way. Yeah. he. I think he was like doing a bit but he was just like turn them all on and so yeah, yeah. we did well, and then he that's how we played that whole that whole song nice <laughs> i bet he sounded really good yeah he he's a one of the most lyrical guitar players i've ever heard kind of like this guy yeah absolutely well yeah he's he's a, he's like a national treasure he is he's special i never even heard of him before i moved here oh really somebody talked me into going to to go see simo uh and pearson opened for him and i was like yeah to hell with jd simo tell me somebody tell me more about jack pearson and i think jd's great i'm just saying like uh yeah jack pearson jack pearson played first so jd simo didn't stand much of a chance as far as my brain and where it was gone yeah yeah for sure yeah uh yeah he's phenomenal so yeah i mean you know I, I, I like equipment, too, and, you know, I like a good guitar. A good guitar, the n- most important thing is you should pick it up and just want to play it for a long period of time. It should feel good in your hand. It should be inspiring. And then when it comes to... Unplugged, even. Plugging into an amp and playing, you know, it's it doesn't matter what it is. It's all about does it do what you need it to do as you're playing, you know? Sure. And that stuff is real specific to each player. You know, it's real specific to me if there's too much compression or too much gain or too much low end or or it's bright but there's no bottom to it. You know, it's like these minute little nuances, these little details that... And it can change depending on the type of music you're playing, even the song, what you're specifically going for. So you just, you know, I just try to get all that stuff within a usable range where the amp and the guitar is 90% of the way doing what I want it to do, where I can just play, you know? Right. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, there's another thing to kind of consider, though, is like, in most cases, the younger guitar player does not have funds for a guitar that sounds like an, like something like that yeah like, yeah you yeah, know yeah. nobody's can, you know not to say that guitar is particularly expensive or whatever it's not like you know no it is 59 well, it's, <laughs> well it's 59, 59 less Paul or yeah. something you know like, when it gets outrageous and like i still don't know how anybody affords that you just have to like wait and find a good deal but it, it's it's interesting to think about because when you're playing on that other instrument you're left with your hands to get the sound that you want so it's almost like you teach your hands how to sound like you want and then you go and you find you know it's like you learn how to use a sword and then you get a great sword yeah yeah, when, yeah. kind of a thing you know what i mean yeah absolutely uh, it's almost like an, an apprenticeship unto yourself tonally. but i think that's that's gotten better uh, i think the quality of like, all guitars like cheap, is better man. cheap guitars are way better than 100 you know you know that that's true but there's like, I had an like an early '90s Squire in the early '90s as a young guitar player, and looking back, like those guitars are desirable these days. I have not that one, but a, a, a '90s Mexi, like a '95 Mexican Squire. It's a freaking great guitar. The only yeah. thing that sucks about it is it's got that whatever the not particularly resonant alloy bridge or whatever. And they built them with weird specs, so finding a replacement replace is just like. Well, look yeah. at the, but look at the the. I think it just depends on like the series that a company, any particular company, happens to put out in in terms of their, you know, beginner guitars, whatever. Yeah. Uh, look at the uh, look at the classic vibe. The Squire Classic Vibe. That I mean, I, I don't know if you played those, but like they came out. In I've heard good things, but I don't think I've ever 2009, actually played. Two thousand nine, two thousand ten. I bought one. My white telly. I ch- ended up changing the neck, but like out of the box. Oh yeah, that was a pretty for th- two thousand nine, two thousand 
two hundred and fifty bucks actually, brand new. Wow, sick guitar. Tim Goins actually told me about those. Really? Yeah, and if if you look at the craftsmanship, like the neck pocket is just about as clean as you could ever hope it to be. It's probably not a particularly great piece of wood, but they did make era specific. Uh, adjustments in in the types of wood like for example the one i bought is made of pine it's kind of like the original i I guess broadcaster uh type thing where like before leo fender decided that pine chips too much and he didn't want to use it anymore too heavy or whatever but it's probably younger pieces of wood it's 100 percent younger which people i think say is more dense but i don't think it absolutely is i don't think that that necessarily a better sound makes if you will i don't think it does i uh, i mean not necessarily i think one one of the things is that if you were to like open up a newer younger piece of wood you would realize that like most of that wood is more wet like it it's more yeah yeah like i i i'm from mississippi so we have a lot of pine when we had hurricane katrina i had to like chainsaw a bunch of those tree trunks and like a bunch of the younger ones are harder to cut through because they're more wet totally um or, or sappy or whatever it is that makes them that kind of dense you sure know? but anyway point being the the squire those squires were good and i've played like the bullets in their total trash jack pearson's joke is someday i'm gonna have a thousand dollars worth of these and they're like 139 dollars yeah well craftsmanship wise um the students when i taught a bunch in chicago the uh i had a few students that had the bullets and they were like you know you could damn near cut your hand sliding down the uh the neck because of yeah. the, the fret work the overhang on the frets you know stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah. yeah forget all that yeah you you said you're doing teaching are you doing like teaching at a spot or are you doing like e-teaching um i teach uh i teach at home online okay. i teach a lot of skype and zoom lessons and i also can people uh, hit you up on your instagram about those yeah lessons? absolutely you have a site or anything um i have a website but also instagram and uh, we'll, my we'll, youtube we'll link, link yeah we'll link yeah, all i'll make a note stuff. so i do a lot of youtube lessons i have a true fire course that i did last year uh hopefully i'm going to be putting out another course somewhere this year that's cool um, my true fire course is cool it's kind of an all encompassing kind of master class thing talking about blues and kind of some i don't know the way i play blues so some Just getting inside jack's brain a little bit about yeah the blues. a little bit that's cool. um some it kind of it kind of stair steps up uh gets progressively more advanced but is that the company that mark does stuff with i know he's sorry a true fire yeah no um that is Ooh, I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, that's my homie Corey from Chicago started that site where they do trans... Horace does the same. Mark and Horace, I think, both do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. True Fire is like a, a big... They, they teach all kinds of stuff, but it's mostly predominantly guitar. Robin Ford does a lot of courses for them. Um, he's okay. Yeah, he's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot he's of, okay. A lot of guys uh, do do courses for them uh i was very lucky to work with them they're that's they're awesome great. Man. yeah so we'll link i'll link all that stuff there as, as many links as Lyndon reminds me to make yeah yeah I, I try when i edit these together i listen to as much as i can but sometimes i just kind of have to like scrub the footage to edit it together so stuff falls through the cracks i, I forgot to put tim galloway's pedal board picture in the last video and i apologize for that well, you know, you don't have to worry about that here. I have That's no, true. Well, I he didn't no bring his either, but we <laughs> talked about it at uh, oh, fa- enough see. length where I was like, I should include a picture of that. And I said it on the thing, and homie was like, uh, "Excuse me, uh, there was a. I was told there would be would be a." a Somebody picture. scrolled right through that video looking for that picture. They were denied. Didn't even exist, man. Sorry about you. sorry about sorry about it. Sorry about it. You can post it in this video. We're talking about it now. That's true. I'll just put a big old picture of Tim Galloway's pedal board right yeah, there here. You're perfect. Right here. Uh, cool. Okay, so that's cool. You're doing the teaching thing. And, like, is that something that you always done, or is that something that you kind of, like, came into? Uh, so I got into the teaching thing because um, a few years ago, uh, right around when my first – son was born i started putting up videos on instagram um 
at the time I was mostly touring, playing with all kinds of artists, whoever I could, you know, work with. Sure. Uh, I toured a lot with a great songwriter named Kim Ritchie. I also toured with various country acts. But I wasn't really playing a lot of blues or jazz or anything like that, uh, which, you know, that's what I really love. I, I love playing the blues. And Same. so I just wanted some avenue to play that. I, I, I think, you know, I'd been in Nashville for a few years, but I don't think people even knew that I was a blues guitar player. They just knew I was a guy they could hire that would learn their songs and show up and not be drunk and get through the gig. You know what <laughs> I mean? Those are very important qualities in a musician. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that wasn't necessarily what I came here to do or what how I wanted to be known. I, totally. I, I was, you know, I also was home a lot more because I had just had a, a kid, so I was kind of off the road a little bit. And it lined up right around when the NAMM show was, the summer NAMM show here. This yeah. was like 2017. Okay. And... I, I went I to the down. NAMM show, and I don't think I'd been in a few years, but it was like, I kind of realized there that, oh, you know, everybody's on social media, everybody's on Instagram, and like, I had no idea that what Instagram, I mean, I knew what it was, but sure, I thought it was just... It's really become quite the tool. I thought it was just girls taking selfies and stuff. I had no idea. Um, it, I mean, it kind of started that way. And then I, well, so then I, I went home and I, I was like, I got to look at this thing and, and, and realized it's, it's all these guitar players, all these musicians. So I thought, man, this is great. I'm just going to start doing this. So I started, um, putting up videos, just playing blues, playing the stuff I wanted to play, the stuff that I was basically practicing at home, sure. playing over, uh, you know, Jazz six two five changes, one or whatever. Yeah. You know, you know, just playing over different stuff that I was working on, things I was transcribing, um, new ideas that I was practicing. I when, would just, when you say transcribe, I think I heard you talking about you. You don't you don't like write it out. You just in transcribe. You just mean like learning. Note yeah, for note. just like listening to it and figuring it out. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't usually write it out. I, I don't either, but I know I don't. Don't. Are you one of those? No, I, I, I had to do it for school and it, it I mean is, I've had to do it, but I like I know like I think Matt very Hornback, like Pete Weasley yeah. like if he you learns know, something, Pete, he Pete writes does it, it out. for everything. I think it's really valuable. I, it's I did extremely it valuable. A few times when I didn't have to for school, but I I don't currently do it anymore. I, I do it a lot now for my teaching. Do you? But not I if, I did too not if I'm just uh learning something you know, if I hear something that I go, Oh, I gotta learn that that phrase or that chorus of that solo. Yeah. Uh Mostly, I just learn it and practice it, and then try to figure out how to incorporate, break it, it down, and, and absorb. Because ideally, I don't want to just play somebody yeah. else's chorus of yeah. a solo, and then tie that into somebody else's chorus of a solo. You know, uh, man, so. I kind of like practice the shit out of it. Not that you asked, I kind of practice the <laughs> shit out of it. But uh, but I find this interesting. It, but then, like, I just forget about it once i feel like i've like you know quote unquote mastered it and like yeah. to my liking i just forget about it and then it shows up or it doesn't yeah i try know? to practice it till it gets to a point where it's um you know you learn a new idea and then you try to tie it in with all these other ideas and you go some of this stuff i've been playing for like 20 years this new idea i just learned this new fingering or thing that i've never played before it's never gonna sound like all this other stuff it's going to take time mm -hmm. but you practice it and practice it and practice it and apply it and hopefully it gets to the point where like it feels as good as other stuff you've yeah, been playing and it becomes a part of your thing and then it's no longer that person's lick because it it morphs and it changes and it the phrasing totally. of it changes the way you get in and out of it changes so How'd you yeah. pick up the jazz stuff, man? You got you got some like really really tasteful bebop vo vocabulary. Well, I love bebop. I, I um I kind of just got into it organically through the blues. I'm a huge fan of Ray Charles. Um, my dad and I went to see him play. Um, I guess I was like 14 or 15 in the late 90s. That's a great bridge between those two worlds. Yeah, it really is. And also BB King. Uh, you know, those big horn bands. Yeah. 
you yeah. know, those guy, a lot of those guys, if you're like a tenor player, those guys are jazz guys that yeah. were like, yeah, like BB doesn't play Charlie Parker licks, but I bet his saxophone player does. Yeah, absolutely. And there's B3 and you know, those guys can swing, they can play all that stuff. If they play a solo, it's going to be some pretty cool stuff. It's not uh John Coltrane, but it's, you know, still got a toe in that world. Um, and I guess when I went to music school, I started kind of being exposed to more jazz sure. and, and, you know, it was kind of the same thing with blues though. Like people go, Oh, you got to listen to Miles Davis. And I, I heard, I remember hearing kind of blue and going, well, this is a beautiful sounding record. It's like one of the best sounding mm-hmm. records ever, but it wasn't, it was kind of like the first time I heard Muddy Waters. It wasn't like, didn't reach out and grab me. It was kind of like, okay, this is, this is great, but. It was a few years later when I um, I heard Oscar Peterson, and I heard Oscar Peterson doing like C Jam Blues, yeah. and that was that was like that really grabbed me because it was it was the it, it came out of the same world of Ray Charles. It was very tied into the blues and the gospel thing, but he just took it to another level. It, but it grooved so hard, he would always bring it back to the blues. <laughs> You are listening to the Gear and Beer Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Bobby Jam's Kitchen. Want to take your home cooking to the next level? Need new recipe ideas or meal inspiration? Like, follow, and subscribe to Bobby Jam's Kitchen on YouTube and Instagram. At Bobby Jam's Kitchen. Cook your food and eat it. So we don't know what happened, but something did. So I think now is as good a time as any to ask you these dumb. Oh, you got dumb these, questions. I got silly questions. <laughs> oh yeah, always oh, my favorite got, segment. Dude, you like lit up. <laughs> oh, I, it's not my first rodeo. I've I've done the dumb <laughs> questions before. Oh, that's the wrong one. My first question will be extremely apropos to our last this our discussions of the whole night but metallica or megadeth uh i think you know the answer to this one and it's megadeth i didn't know the answer uh, but that is a great one i don't really care i i i saw metallica live in the uh 96 uh, on Lollap- the Lollapalooza tour that oh, they yeah. did i was uh-huh. 12 yeah um Apparently on that tour, they only agreed to do it if Soundgarden would also play on the bill with them, because I guess Soundgarden had already done a Lollapalooza, which in those days it wasn't... They were trying to do new bands every time. Big mistake on Metallica's part. Soundgarden played right before them, and completely, it was done. It was like... I'm a big fan of Soundgarden. There's no more rock needing to happen here. The rock has been done. <laughs> Go home. It's been done largely in phrases of six beats. It was, I mean, yeah, they were just, they were loud and raunchy. And then, you know, Metallica is not my thing. You know, I, 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 I get it, but it's not my thing. I like all of it, but I love Megadeth. And I, I love that. I love that answer. And I definitely know the, ne- the answer to this next question, but that's going to be jazz or metal. Obviously jazz. Yeah. yeah. Live or session? Like personally, for me, I uh, yeah. Um, live, definitely live. I mean, I'm not much of a session musician. I mean, I like records. I like a lot of live records. I like a lot of studio records. It's all good. Hell yeah! Know. I feel you. Uh, single coil or humbucker? I like both a lot. Um, Pick one. It's got to be the right pickup, but if you only get one kind, which one does it have to be? Neck humbucker. If I, if I had to do my whole life with just a neck humbucker, I'd be fine. That's that's cool. I dig that vibe. Yeah. Volume pedal or knob? 
Uh, volume knob usually, but I like a volume pedal. When you use, I like vo- the way Larry Carlton uses a volume pedal a what lot. What do you mean by that? Like his swell, his, his the way he swells into. So notes. using it for swells, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so then you would use it at the top of the chain and not post gain. Yeah, definitely before the gain. Yeah, that's how I like it too. But that's I've come to learn that not a lot of people like it that way. If you look, there's a great you're post gain, aren't you? Um, no. Oh, I thought you were pre gain. There's a great record um, that Larry played on called uh, by Bobby Bland called Dreamer. Uh, it's Larry Carlton and Dean Parks on guitar. It's oh. the '70s. It's the '70s. It's I think it's Murderers pre, Row. I think it's pre. Um, Steely Dan. I think it's actually the record that was the reason Steely Dan hired those two guys. Uh, because it, yeah. you listen to it and then you listen to songs like Josie, you're like, oh yeah, they were just, they were like, yeah, we'll take those guys. What's the name of the record? Dreamer? Uh, Dreamer, yeah. Mind making a note? I'd love to include that. But there's that. some, uh, I'd love to, there's some mostly Larry, just to listen to There's it some myself. Larry Carlton <laughs> swells, like where he swells into a phrase and bends a note and it's like... It's really, and I don't think it's this. I think it's volume pedal, pedal. kind of thing. Yeah, that dude's something else, man. His yeah. son's a fantastic bass player as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Do you do you use? Uh, I think it, I, you don't anymore. But did you ever like have a compressor on your board, or do you like to use? Compression I used in the to studio? use one sometimes. Um, I used to use one because I played a super reverb a lot, and sometimes you'd get into a situation where you couldn't really turn it up and the natural compression wouldn't really happen so i would use a compressor to kind of help combat that but that makes sense no i'm not really a compressor guy that's a smart use for a compressor especially not with a humbucker guitar but totally understand that um jazz bass or precision bass the precision bass all day everybody's a p guy well, I mean, I'm not a bass player, but that, well, no. that yeah, is the I bass. ask all kinds of... That is the bass that I own, is a precision Fair bass. Enough. If you hired somebody to play on your record, you're apt to would, call a P guy. That's I, what would, you're gonna I wouldn't give a shit. Oh, okay. I would say, I would hire the guy that... Plays uh, like you want him the to play? Plays the, yeah. They could play whatever they I mean, it to totally, play. totally. But I, that, the question was, you have to pick one, and you picked P. You did well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Man, I'm sorry. Are you? Do you said Dreamer? Is it Bobby Bland? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great record. Um, Check that out. If you, that doesn't seem like it would be a hard question for you to answer, but l- let's say you, you've got any guitar and any amp that you want, you get a pedal. What's the one pedal? Um, I do, and not a tuner. Some kind of boost or drive. Um, it's not one that you just love that you find yourself going back to. I like the Analog Man uh, King of Tone pedal. I've got one of those. I like this pedal called the Duelist. Yeah. I use that a lot. It's a great sounding pedal. Uh, who, who makes that? Um, King uh, Tone. Some yeah. guy in England. I think somebody has one of those on their board that came It's cool. Here. I like it a lot. Um, those are both great pedals. I would take either one of those. No preference. Well, I have both of them on my board, so. Well, there you go. That's you it. don't have to choose, and that's oh, yeah. that's what this life is all about. Excuse me. Um, do you have? No. Pick a favorite venue that you've played in. Oh, my favorite venue. This might take me a while to. Well, man, I, off the top of my head, I'm trying to rack my brain. Um, it can just be off the top of your head. Think of a place that you like to play. Let me let me let me ask you a different question. That's the same kind of question. Club, theater, or larger venues. Um, I like them all, but I like playing a club. I mean, a club a club vibe is just a different vibe than playing at a theater. It is. Uh, it can be fun to play. You know, I've ne- I've never played with anybody that played arenas or anything like that. So I think I've done one of each kind. Um, 
like one gig in each kind of large place. Theaters are great. I love playing a theater. One club gig. Yeah, I've done one club gig. <laughs> I've done one theater. No. Yeah. Uh, I like a I like a small theater both for performing and for viewing. I saw a Steely Dan in a four thousand seat theater in Tulsa. If it, it sounds good. I mean, I've there's seen no s- reason for it not to. It is. I've built seen some Saturday. great shows at the Ryman. Um, I've seen some great shows at some of the old theaters in like San Francisco, like the Great American Music Hall. Oh, cool, um, man! Some great shows uh, in L. A. I, L. A. I like a lot of the outdoor amphitheaters, like the Hollywood Bowl, yeah. the Greek Theater, uh-huh. um, the John Anson Ford Theater. There's some really great outdoor venues there. It's a great place but, to be outside. Yeah, it's like you know, seventy degrees. Yeah. at nighttime. It's like being inside, yeah, yeah. but outside. Yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> I would say club. I like. I'm a club guy. Clubs are a lot of fun. The most, the closest interaction to the intensity, uh, with the exception of, I guess, like uh, being at a metal show in an arena. The best shows I've ever seen were at the Baked Potato in Los Angeles. I've never been, but um, uh, was that because of quality music or like quality of sound or both? All of it. All yeah. of it. The vibe. Overall the sound. Vibes. I mean, you know, you got guys like Mike yeah. Landau playing in there, you know. Oh, yeah, for so, sure. I bet like, you saw a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> you got a favorite one in town? Favorite club in town? Um, to play at? I well, I like playing at the out. Underdog because oh, that's yeah. where I have my <laughs> Thursday night residency. Yes, yeah. please plug that. So you're doing a uh, Thursday night yeah. residency. It's 8 to 10 at the Underdog in yeah. East Nashville. And the Underdog's awesome. Guthrie Trap plays there Monday nights. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you great. guys were doing a like an all star thing, a, you did a couple of them, right? He's been doing that, yeah. I did the first one. Um, what night like are you, you and, on Tuesday? You and Thursday. Corey and Ford, and uh, yeah, that was the first one. And was then there one more person, he had uh, the second one, he had Luke McCreary, uh, who's obviously phenomenal, a monster. Um, and some other, uh, I, I went to that one too. He's doing that like every month or two months or something, month and a half. Uh, that's a Monday night thing too, but he just does his trio down there on Monday nights too, and then I do my trio on Thursday night. It's cool. Who's it, playing in your trio? Uh, Jeffrey Clemens from G Love and Dave Jakes, who was John Prine's bass player for a long time. Okay, great band. I'm gonna definitely not this week as we figured out earlier, but uh, maybe not next week either. But two weeks from now, I'm gonna be there. All right. Um, you gotta. Give me a piece of don't give me give a piece of advice to young aspiring professional players. Whether it's just something that you see people doing that you don't think they should, or something that you personally experienced, or just like a shut up and practice, like make. Uh, make I mean, sure. there's a lot of different things you could say. I would definitely totally. say, you know. You can waste a lot of time, especially with drugs and alcohol, you know, you got to be, you got to be smart with that stuff. Don't waste 10 years of your life down that path. Um, and then I would say, you know, figure out what you want, you know, figure out like, what do you really want out of this whole thing? Because, you know, we all know if, if you want money, go, go be a doctor, or manage a hedge fund. Um, sure. But, you know, what is it that you really want to do and then figure out an avenue to get that? Nowadays, it's wide open. You know, with social media, with the internet, just figure out your path and figure out how to to get on that path. There's and a you, lot of saturation in the market, but there certainly are a lot of different paths that did not exist 10 years ago. Absolutely. You're totally right about that. Absolutely. I mean, the, there was a period there in like the late 90s, early 2000s, where it was a no man's land. The record companies kind of died, and there wasn't anything to fill the void. And now, you know, I think it's, it's maybe even better than it was back, uh, you know, in the 80s, 90s, you know, because it's... In terms it's, of paths to take art and get it to a fan base... 100%. Yeah, and you can be really independent, but you have to have a, you know, you got to have good art. You got to know what you're, you know what you're after. That, so, uh, yeah, that's yeah. A, a great, a great point. Excellent, so, yeah. excellent point. In fact, um, 
is do you have a professional accomplishment to this point that you're like if you had to pick your most proud point that you would look to um well i would definitely say like like the recent teaching stuff that i've been doing my patreon page getting that true fire course out um you know that wasn't something i really ever planned to do but it happened and um yeah i'm incredibly proud of it i mean that's awesome you know yeah it's because i it's just me doing doing what i do doing what i want to do and aside from like writing songs and putting out your own music i think teaching is one of the most rewarding things you can do as a musician because it directly affects people you know as a guitar player it's like unless you're an artist and doing your own music you're playing somebody else's music generally totally um but when you're teaching you get that connection to people really one-on-one helping somebody uh, achieve you know their goals so yeah it's something i i do really cherish that's awesome man this uh craft needs good teachers who know things and aren't just like okay what song do you want to want me to transcribe live on the spot for you today yeah yeah and it's cool man and that can be helpful too all those lines are blurring too i remember you know when i was younger the attitude was kind of like oh well the people that can't do it for a living teach but that's all different now you know everything is I would a, say. a lot of people that um, are successful professional musicians are teaching now and want to be teaching um because it's just yeah it's a whole different landscape in my experience at least like the teaching that i was doing i was younger and i was teaching much younger people i wasn't teaching people guitar i was babysitting people for 30 minutes to an hour at a time with guitars in their hands that's what really what it came yeah, down yeah. to and i had like 42 students a week i was like i was doing it and i got real burnout real quick because of the 42 students about four of them actually cared about and were good at music and mm-hmm. guitar and stuff so I, I imagine people that are seeking you out are truly like into learning the yeah, instrument yeah. and the, yeah, the for craft sure. and stuff. Yeah, and so for sure. Props, props on that. Thank I you. got two questions left for you, okay. and then we'll let you get up out of here, or we can go downstairs and eat beer, cheese, and sausage. Um, off the top of your head, three Desert Island records. Um. I don't want deep reflection. I want a different answer oh. next time I ask you. Give me the give me the three top the top of your head. Um Cannonball Adderley live in San Francisco. Yeah. Fantastic record. record. Um It's like it's uh Yeah, that's the that's what I'm thinking. I yeah, I know that. Starts yeah. over Alabama. Yeah. It's supposed to be Maz's session, but he missed the plane or something. No, it's uh It's a live record. The live record so something uh, uh yeah not not stars out there I, I know what you're talking about no this is a, a live that was a live record no it's a live record and he like uh he has some really interesting like mic work in between some of the songs yeah yeah it's super yeah awesome. and it's like you can barely hear it spontaneous yeah. combustion is on there work song is on there it's him and nat it's uh, f- fantastic it is that fantastic. um any of the early atlantic ray charles stuff pick one um well, I just have like the box set, so I, I don't know how all that stuff was released. I think a lot of it was put out as singles. Oh, I'll copy that. But all those tunes, I mean, um, you know, Hard Times, you know, all of those songs are great. Um, and then I would say, you know, maybe Aretha Franklin live at the Fillmore, you know. Uh, with you know King Curtis, Cornell Dupree on guitar, Bernard Purdy, all those guys, Billy yeah. Preston. Yeah, I mean that's it's a, that's a definite major record. Oh, Al Green. Um, um, that's four records. Al Green. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, why can't I think of the name? The big one. You can't because I put you on the spot. I don't know what it's um, called, but I know what you're talking about. Love and happiness. That no, uh, the one with. Uh, I sound like an idiot now. It's got um, "How Can You Mend This Broken Heart." It's got you know 
it's uh it's the al green record um i don't know what it's called either everybody knows what we're talking about and i'll figure it out and put a link to it if i remember which i hopefully will okay jack i have one final question yeah you're in the king's court and you have to choose albert bb freddy or king's x um (laughs) no one's chosen king's x yet some people would definitely choose King's X. I like um, I like all of them. I don't know. You're leaving out another good king, though. Earl King from New Orleans. He's not part of the. King's He's not court right mentioned now. in the Kings, and it's disappointing to me. I'm trying to change that. I'm well, let's let's do the that. Earl then. King team. The He's Jack King. Yeah. Uh, send, send me a link of some Earl King that you think is awesome, video or record or whatever, and I'll oh, include yeah. it in this. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't want to have to choose. But I know you don't. That's the point. I mean, I, I think Albert King is the most unique guitar player, like maybe the most unique electric guitar player ever. You Definitely know what I mean? I mean, nobody tuning down and all the crazy bendy like, things. Like, where did that shit come from? It's Left-handed. not even. It's not even like... Even with BB, who was a huge innovator of the electric guitar, when you hear early BB and you hear T Bone Walker and you hear, you know, the people he was listening to, you see the connection, you see the evolution. Yeah. Albert King, you know, was supposedly influenced by BB and stuff, but you don't see the connection. Like, I, I don't, it just kind of came out of him. So an authentic voice and he's the guy i I probably as a guitar just based on his guitar solos i probably get the most kick out of listening to oh yeah but i i mean i also like weep like a baby listening to bb king so and freddie you know they're all fantastic and it sucks to have to choose them but you've done it and you've chosen albert king and it's a fine choice you can't you can't choose wrong even with what's king's your choice uh, i choose freddie king because i'm from texas yeah well freddie also i have a spiel that i've said many times but i i take bb as my singer albert is my guitar player and they're gonna be, and they can play freddie king songs we'll see when it comes to songs, that's where you got to pepper in Earl King because he was a great songwriter. Okay, really, I mean, I don't know shit about Earl King. Really, was a great songwriter. So I should okay, definitely so learn. Top three Texas blues musicians. Who are your top three? Uh, I would say Bugs Henderson because he, I had a personal relationship and he like opened my eyes. I mean, he's a, a definite blues legend. But he, like, gave me a lesson in the sixth grade that, like, changed everything for me. Nice. Um, obviously, Stevie Ray Vaughan and then Freddie King. Okay. Those are the, those are the ones there's that had the so most many, influence though. on me. Yeah, yeah. There's so there, many. Yeah, I mean, where do you, where do you even start? I, you, I asked you an impossible question. You followed up with an equally impossible question. Yeah, yeah. It's actually pretty easy for me because, again, those are the three that had the most influence on me. Yeah, yeah. What are your three favorite? They change all the time. Probably Albert Collins would have to be in there. Uh, I didn't even know he was from Texas. I thought he was from Mississippi for some reason. No, oh, he's definitely like a Houston area guy, I think. Um, I love Albert Collins. Plays a telly. I, mean, what can you, what do you, I really like Anson, Thunder, uh, Anson Thunderbird, too. And you know who used to play bass for him? I do. Do you? I do. I do know that. I had a conversation about that the other day. Did you? Um, I also, yeah, probably Freddie King. Um, I love Freddie. But there's so many good guys. I mean, um, Johnny Guitar Watson. I mean, I might have to put that in there. That might have sure. to be my yeah, favorite. Yeah, you know, I don't ever think about... Johnny Guitar Watson had like three licks, but man, they're fucking good licks, man. Sometimes you know? three is all you need, bro. Yeah. So, shit, all it took for B.B. King was one note in a lot of different occasions. Sometimes yeah. one is all you need, but... Yeah, Johnny Guitar Watson, I would say. That would be one of my guys. Well, hell yeah. Jack, thanks so much for coming out and hanging out with us and... uh bringing that beautiful guitar and absolutely man. that uh those beautiful 
licks and oh, yeah. the tasty licks and my pleasure um we'll be sure to put links to all the stuff that you all your your website and your instagram and uh true fire yeah your true fire and all, all your stuff you can find all that stuff in the show notes like usual uh all the usual links i as you likely know i forget stuff and uh please remind me and i'll be sure to do anything i can to correct that um jack thanks again man appreciate Thank it you, linda man. mccarty Thank twisting you, is tweaking twisting and tweaking make sure you follow and subscribe if you haven't already appreciate you tuning in we'll see you next time on gear and beer <laughs>